Hi, welcome back to Not So Obvious Watches. I'm Pete McConville, and this is my a little bit late hot take on the Alpina Star Timer Heritage Man, Pilot Heritage Manufacturer. Way too many words in that title. This watch is a weird throwback to the 50s and 60s. I think it is really cool, um, and that's going to come through in my hot take, but there is a problem with it, and this problem would probably stop me buying it. Uh, I'll be interested to know whether you think it's a problem and whether it would stop you buying it too. But enough about that. We'll get into that during the hot take. Quick one. What are these? These are not reviews, not critiques. I am have not had the watch in hand. I'm working off the same pictures, renders, and information that you are. Uh, reserve the right to change my mind later. I would suggest you uh, treat what I'm about to say with some caution as well. If you're happy with that and you still want to hear what I have to say, see you on the other side of the intro. Okay, so let's get into this watch. First off, which one are we talking about? Just in case you missed the intro, it's the Alpina Star Timer Pilot Heritage Manufacturer. Excuse me while I look down to give you the reference number. It is AL709SR4SH6, I believe. Some basics about this watch. Comes, it's steel. There is a gold plated version, but I'm only going to really talk about the steel today. Uh, the case is a relative of the Star Timer Pilot Heritage case used on the GMT and also a Chrono, uh, a broad cushion case design. I've held those other two watches in hand. They are lovely. Um, I have no reason to believe that the case work on this will be anything less. Um, it is 42 millimeters in diameter, which will immediately have a bunch of you turning off. However, it's only 45 millimeters lug to lug. What does that mean? It means this watch will fit pretty much anyone. Okay, so that's the case. Now let's get into the dial. Look, there's a lot of talk in a few reviews on this I read and in some of the, the Alpina material about this being a, in, a watch inspired by Alpina pilots watches of the 50s. Frankly, I don't see it. I've looked and looked and looked and I'm an Alpina guy and I can't find Alpina Pilots watches of the 50s that look remotely like this. For me, the dial and particularly those big blocky chunks of uh, indices, that just screams late 1960s to me. I've got a watch from the 1960s with a very, very similar dial. I've got a watch from Alpina from the late 1960s with a very similar dial. And yeah, this to me doesn't say 50s pilot's watch. This says um, not late 1960s, contemporary postmodern um, general sports watch. Now, I've got to be very clear. I do not say that as a bad thing. I love that time frame. I love the designs that came out of it. Not only that, I've predicted <laughs> that this is what a lot of other brands will be doing about now. So I'm actually kind of heartened to see a brand take on, to at least fulfill my, uh, my prediction. Before I go on, I should say this watch is not the only new release to start fulfilling my prediction of a lot more watches from that sort of 60s, 70s, and even 80s postmodern era. We've, we've also had the, a new uh, version of the Edox Hydra Sub and more recently the Doxa 600T. One a design from the late 60s, 70s, another design from the 80s. So like I said, I'm really seeing the industry pick up and run with this much later set of neoclassic designs. Okay, so that's all about the case and the dial, but I mentioned earlier that the real star of the show here, the thing that we want to really focus on is the movement. Because this watch has got a new manufacture movement. The clue was in the name of the watch, I suppose. What is this movement? Well, Alpina have reached back in time into their own past, but broadly the past of much of the industry really to the age of the 30s and the 40s when bumper movements were huge and brought us a new bumper movement. What the hell is a bumper movement, I can imagine you asking. Okay, it's, the, it's an early version of automatic movements. If you're used to an automatic movement, today, in modern auto today, 
Look at the rotor and it will spin 360 degrees, some in one direction, some in two, most in two. Now, before those came out, automatic watches had a, had a rotor that looked and acted much the same, except instead of spinning a full 360 degrees, it rocked, it bumped between uh, two stops on a much shorter arc. It moved backwards and forwards, usually about 120 degrees. This one actually goes out to 330 degrees, which is kind of weird. I think they're doing this purely so that they can say it's a bumper movement, but nonetheless, the bumpers come from the stops used to stop and then redirect the rotor as it swings back. Normally that was done in the old days with springs at either end. Uh, this one's got a slightly different arrangement. There's some sort of gearing and system with, at, the, at the rotor spigot, but I'm not sure exactly how that works. Don't think it's entirely relevant. Okay, so the, why don't you see bumper movements anymore? It's actually pretty simple. A full spinning rotor is simply better. It's more efficient, it's more reliable long-term, requires less maintenance, and is just more seamless in operation. And at a time in the like the early to mid-50s when bumpers were being replaced and watches were actual tools, all of those things were absolutely essential. And you can understand why bumpers basically died. However, it's not the 1950s and watches aren't tools. It's 2022 and watches are jewelry today. Well, mechanical watches are jewelry anyway. So in that world, and this is a watch being marketed to, therefore, jewelry, jewelry wearers and enthusiasts. This watch is discretionary. It's probably part of a larger collection. It will have a duty cycle and a wear uh, life um, much, much lower than the watches back in the 50s. As a result, to use uh, sort of basketball parlance, we're in a no harm, no foul kind of situation here. You don't, those problems of the past of inefficient winding and, um, and longer and, and potentially more reliability problems aren't really a problem anymore. They're in a, in a world where we all have multiple watches and this is just one watch within a rotation. That's no big deal. Likewise, now that these are anachronisms, these mechanical watches are anachronisms designed and, and worn to remind us of the past, to give us a, a, a piece of jewelry that connects to a, a history hundreds of years long, that, it, that this watch isn't seamless, that you can kind of, you have to wind it a bit more often and you can feel it physically on your, your, on your wrist, is actually no longer a negative. It's probably a positive. So that's why it kind of makes sense to go back to an older movement, perhaps an obsolete movement, even if it does require a bit more care, even if you do know that you're wearing it more, that's kind of the point. It's that thinking that led Omega to reintroduce the, the Omega, the Caliber 321. It's that same idea of it doesn't matter that it's not as good as the old, the new movements. That's not the point. The romance, the history, the story of the 321 means that it is an insanely desirable watch, regardless of the fact that it is objectively worse than the cheaper and more readily available new ones. The same is really true here with the Alpina. Okay, so what do I think? It's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, just first off, I've got to say, I feel like it's a bit of a mishmash of eras. Technically, yes, bumper watches did still exist in the 1950s, but their heyday was really the 30s and 40s. So I really, from a movement point of view, this watch makes me think of 30s and 40s more than 50s. Likewise, the, 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 design, the case design, dial design, furniture design, all reminds me much more of late 60s and 70s than 50s. But everyone keeps telling me that this is a watch supposed to hark back to the 1950s, and it just, it just doesn't seem to do so. And there's a little part of my brain which is thrown out by that. Now, that could be just me. Maybe, maybe this actually is, maybe there is a 1950s reference that this obliquely pays reference to. But for me, yeah, that's kind of, quirky. The next thing I would say though is none of that really matters. It's a it's a kind of academic interest. It goes through my mind and it makes me think, but I, I don't care. 
looking at this watch, I think it's just gorgeous. I love the case. I've, I haven't held this watch, but I've held close relatives and they wear beautifully. They are great cases. They're well made. Likewise, I haven't got this watch, but I've got other Alpinas with similar kind of dials and I have no doubt that this is going to be equally well made. Looking at the renders and photos, it looks brilliant. This watch is gorgeous. I absolutely love it. But I'm not likely to buy it. And I've already said that, that I'm not likely to buy this, but I haven't said why. And that's what I'm going to do now. This watch is $4,950 Australian. It's just too expensive. I can't, I can't see myself buying it. Now, before I go on, I am not saying that the watch is overpriced. I am not saying that the watch should be cheaper. I don't know any of those things to be true. This is a brand new movement. Well, it's actually a very old movement, but it's a new design of a movement. There's a lot of stuff that's new in this. It's probably going to be made to a very high standard. So it's not about that I don't think it's worth it. Rather, the, rather when you start getting up near as damn at $5,000, um, I have a lot of watches I want to buy in that price range, and I have a lot of watches I want to buy more than this one. So it's not, as I said, it's not that I think this watch is poor value. It could be. Rather that I simply wouldn't prioritize spending $5,000 on this watch. As I said, I have a whole bunch of other stuff I'd rather buy first. And so for me, the price is something of a barrier. But all of that said, what do you guys think? Um, do you like it? Do you like the look? Do you like the bumper movement? Do you think that this idea of these kind of reaching back in time to obsolete, even within the realm of mechanical watches, obsolete technologies is interesting, is worth doing? Or do you think that even though the base technology is an anachronism, that we should still be trying to advance um, uh mechanical watches and never look back what are your thoughts on that i'm i'm really interested to know anyway so i've been pete mcconville this has been not so obvious watches hope you enjoyed this and i'll see you later bye <music>